While the cotton gin is credited with the growth of cotton agriculture in America, I believe that a second invention also contributed to that growth. It was the Western River Steamboat. The Western Rivers are a vast network of waterways, most of which are blessed with fertile soil. The river soil and the warm southern sun provided the basic needs of a cotton plant. The river provided a transportation route and irrigation water. The gin provided seedless cotton fiber and the Western River Steamboat provided a way to get the crop to market. Development in the South focused on the many rivers that could deliver king cotton to the seaports. While the common image that people conjure when thinking about a steamboat is a large, luxurious steamboat with gingerbread ornamentation, gilded fixtures, chandeliers, plush carpets, fine dining, and well-dressed and gentlemanly riverboat gamblers. Most steamboats were far from that description. Most boats may have provided accommodations for passengers, but their purpose was for moving freight, and cotton was the most lucrative commodity moved by steamboats in the South. Boats that carried both passengers and freight and made stops at a number of ports on a scheduled basis were called packet boats. The packet boats had nice accommodations for their wealthier passengers but most passengers were deck passengers who stayed on the deck, ate food brought along for the trip, and slept on the deck where they could find a comfortable spot. Wealthy men who traveled on the more luxurious vessels did enjoy games of chance in a nice lounging area. There were men of wealth who generally played an honest game among friends who were able to handle large losses. The professional riverboat gambler didn't fit this description. They most often were deck passengers who would find the less fortunate people on deck and entice them with the chance of leaving the boat with more money than they boarded with. He would intentionally lose a few hands to excite his opponent into making poor decisions, and then he would start playing a serious game and soon leave his opponent broke. The true riverboat gambler was a scoundrel, cheat, and con artist. Many found themselves tossed off a boat some distance from town. Roustabouts on packet boats had lots of downtime and they would engage in gambling themselves. Competitiveness was part of their nature. Often they played cards or dominoes, and other times they would engage in competitions of human strength and endurance to see who wore the cock feather. Steamboat roustabouts, sometimes called cotton stackers, were a very tough breed. Most were slaves. They weren't actually owned by the steamboat line, but acquired through lease agreements. They would be chosen for their size and strength. Rather than being on the plantation hoeing or picking cotton all season long, the cotton stackers were doing port calls all along the major rivers. For that reason, they were considered the most worldly of the slave class in the South. They did get to enjoy shore leave on their journeys, and they enjoyed their time ashore in a most unusual way. Cotton stackers, being very competitive people, would engage in competitions of strength and skill. The competitions would include such events as bare-knuckle boxing, arm wrestling, wrestling, and even professional skills like lifting the heaviest cotton bales or carrying at the furthest distance. The winner of these competitions won the honor of wearing a rooster feather in his hat. While on shore leave, the cotton stackers would group together and follow their champion. 
The man with the rooster feather would walk with the greatest pride and confidence surrounded by his entourage who were cheering him on. He was known as the cock of the walk. The reason for the spectacle was to draw the attention of other steamboat crews, for they too had their own cock of the walk. When two men with rooster feathers met up, there would be a, the usual heckling and exchanges of insults while the men placed their bets. Then the fight was on and it was a hard fought battle. The loser of the fight was to remove the feather from his hat and humble himself for the rest of the stay for there could only be one cock of the walk in any riverboat town. Steamboats became part of life in the old southwest and midwest but there was a new west that people set their sights on. There they hoped to make their fortune. Upon the purchase of Spanish Louisiana, Thomas Jefferson commissioned the Corps of Discovery. Part of the purpose of the Lewis and Clark, Zebulon Pike, Dunbar Hunter, and Freeman Custis expedition was to determine the navigation possibilities on the Missouri, Arkansas, Washita, and Red Rivers. It was reported that the Missouri could be navigated nearly as far as the Continental Divide. The Arkansas was found navigable for a great distance into the west. The Washita was found to be navigable for a distance into Arkansas, but was not a river that would reach out to the new borders of the nation. The Red River was found to be obstructed by the Great Red River Raft. The fur industry in the new lands attracted the attention of long hunters who were feeling the resources being depleted in the east. It also attracted other men of adventure, such as river men. A new culture arose in the Rockies. Those adventurers that went into the west to make their fortunes became known as mountain men. American Fur Company formed by John Jacob Astor worked to establish a monopoly in the North American fur trade that would reach from the Great Lakes across the Great Plains and into the Pacific Northwest. His venture into the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain trade was facilitated by a partnership with the Shoto brothers, Augusta and Pierre, who established a fort at the headwaters of the Missouri named Fort Benton. The fort was named for Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri. Fort Benton was an important Indian trade post for peltry in the early 19th century. Around the beginning of the Civil War, gold was found in Montana. Steamboats were needed to get further upriver. Another steamboat legend made a name for himself taking steamboats up rivers that previously steamboat pilots would have never attempted. His name was Grant P. Marsh, and he was trained as a pilot by Samuel Clemens. To get steamboats in previously unnavigable waters, Marsh used two techniques. Marsh would either run a winch line ahead to pull the boat over easier obstructions, or grasshopper the boat over the more difficult sandbars. Grasshoppering involved placing spars on each side of the bow, out forward and into the sand. Strong ropes or housers would run from a capstan winch to a block at the end of the spars, then run back to the bow. Tightening the ropes with the capstan would cause the spars to pull into the sandbar, lifting up the bow which would be assisted with the torque of, a, of the paddle wheel. This would move the boat forward a little at a time till eventually the sandbar was traversed. Grant P. Marsh's many accomplishments include reaching the highest navigable points on both the Missouri and Yellowstone rivers. Marsh set several speed records on the upper Missouri while piloting the far west, Marsh evacuated the wounded from the Battle of Little Bighorn and got them to Bismarck, North Dakota in four days. Marsh's greatest accomplishment was working several decades on the upper Missouri 
the most difficult river to navigate in America and never losing a boat. Missouri steamboats moved furs, buffalo robes, mining supplies, and even gold worth millions of dollars. The Yellowstone was built in Louisville, Kentucky for the American Fur Company. While it did work the Upper Missouri for most of its lifespan, it did take a journey down the Mississippi through the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and up the Brazos River in Texas. The year was 1836. The Brazos were swollen with flood waters and Sam Houston's army was on the west side with Santa Ana's army in pursuit. With the help of the Yellowstone, the Texans made it to the other side of the Brazos. A few days later, an overconfident Santa Ana had his army with their backs to Buffalo Bayou, and Sam Houston made his attack. Santa Ana was defeated in a matter of minutes. Steamboats served as the first towboats, increasing their freight volume greatly by using large barges to carry the freight. While cotton was king in the south during the early days of steamboating, timber became king in the mid-19th century and into the early 20th century in the upper Mississippi region. Steamboats were an important part of that industry. Steamboats were more efficient in rafting logs to the mills than having men ride the log rafts and guide the logs with poles. At first, Small rafts towed by single sto steamboats were the norm. Then someone came up with the idea of putting a steamboat perpendicular on the bow end of the raft. Then very long rafts could be shipped. The pilot in the lead boat served as a lookout and would use his boat as a bow thruster to move the raft through tight turns in the river. Steamboats served as ferries also. They first carried people across large rivers, but as railroads became the dominant mode of transportation and rail bridges were not yet spanning the Mississippi, steamboats ferried rail cars across the river. Gold rushes in California and Alaska, a mass movement of settlers to farm in Oregon's Columbia River Basin, and the timber boom in the Pacific Northwest sparked the construction of Western River steamboats and they became a, as common a sight on the Yukon, Columbia, and Sacramento rivers as they, on the Ohio and Mississippi. I'm saving their story for another episode.